All right, folks, we are back for another Conversations with CAG-T on Tuesday night at five o'clock Colorado time. Um, if you are just tuning in, um, we wanna just remind you where you can access the past lives that we've done. Um, we had Teresa Newsom on last week and hers was excellent. If you'd like to catch that, you could access that through coloradogifted.org. If you go to the resources tab, Conversations with CAG-T has its own page and you can access hers and all the other great presentations we've had over the last month and a half. I can't believe it's been almost six weeks since we've been doing this. Um, and we just keep having uh, great topics and great conversations. So we're excited that you are joining us. Um, we're gonna go ahead and introduce Jen today. This is Jen Merrill and uh, Jen is out of Illinois. Um, she is a writer and blogger, and um, she writes the blog Laughing at Chaos. She's also a band director and parents of gifted and twice exceptional kiddos. Um, she has a book out it's called, it's called If This is a Gift, Can I Send It Back? And if you are uh, privy to gifted children or gifted yourself, you probably understand what that title means. Um, her second book is coming out and um, is in progress, and it discusses the needs of parents as they raise their gifted kids, which I know um, so many of us could use a little support in that department because it is in a unique job that we have. Um, oh, yeah. <laughs> so we have at CAG-T um, on our Facebook page over the last decade have shared Jen's blog, Laughing at Chaos, multiple times. And it was with great pleasure that she agreed to do a Conversations with CAG-T with us. And we are super excited to have her here tonight. So without further ado, I'm going to hand it over to Jen and let her go ahead and um, talk a little bit about what she came to, to chat about with us tonight. Excellent. Thank you so much, Miranda. As she said, uh, welcome. I'm going to do my thing here and get my whole setup, you know, set up and share my screen. And boy, I hope you are all seeing a very large photo of poppies now because otherwise I'm up. There we go. Thank you for the thumbs up. So I'm going to finish setting up here and sorry about my palm. So thank you for joining tonight. I know there are so many other things you could be doing on a summer evening and I'm grateful you decided to hop on and join this webinar. First, before I even get started, a small disclaimer. I am not an expert nor a professional speaker. I am not the sage on a stage. I simply observe and comment on the challenges and absurdities of gifted life and attempt to help other parents feel less alone. At best, I am the parenting version of a black box warning and not the black box full of wine that can usually be found in my kitchen cabinet. I have made so many mistakes, have said so many things and I have more than a few regrets. But a lot of what I know and say tends to resonate with others. And with that in mind, something people have often told me when they read my writing is how honest and authentic it is. So I'm gonna be real honest and authentic right now. My office from where I am presenting is an open loft with no door. I am right outside my teen son's room and my husband is downstairs cooking dinner and inevitably something is going to crash. He's a great cook, but there may be some background noise. Um, this is the first time I've given this presentation and I spent the better part of this afternoon teaching middle school band lessons online. So with that in mind, listen with a grain of salt and let's get this party started. And already I have forgotten to change my slides. So hi, there's my slide about I am not an expert. <laughs> I, uh, just a reminder or a warning. Uh, there's the photo of me, just in case you forgot what I looked like from about two minutes ago when I was introduced. And here we go. Oh wait, see, I've already messed this up. All right, about me. I have many roles in my life. Multitasking apparently is not a good one. Anyway, I am a writer, a middle school band director. I'm an advocate for the parents of gifted and twice exceptional kids wife, mother, and all around Renaissance woman. My interests and passions vastly outnumber the hours I have in this lifetime and the next. I weave together all of my interests, my expertise, and learning to create new connections between people and ideas in hopes of helping others laugh at the chaos 
to have the strength to advocate another day and to not feel so alone. I want to make a difference and I hope that somehow, somehow I do. As I said, I am the mom of two twice exceptional sons. The oldest is 19 and will start college this fall after a gap year this year, working full time as a software developer. I never ever thought I would homeschool through high school, but he and I made it. His younger brother is just shy of 16, in fact, will be 16 in two weeks, and is doing really well in the local high school. I am praying it stays that way, but if it all goes pear-shaped, at least I already kind of know how to homeschool. I just really don't want to. I've been blogging at Laughing at Chaos since 2006, which led to my not-so-secret desire to be a writer. If this is a gift, can I send it back? It was published by GHS Press in 2012, and my second book on the self-care and needs of parents is in progress. My struggles with self-care are legendary, so the irony that I write and present on it is not at all lost on me. All right, back to the dog. So for the last several years, I've been fortunate to talk with a lot of parents, sometimes simple conversations, Sometimes tearful bitch sessions, phone, emails, in person. It doesn't matter where in the world they live, parents have many of the same worries and problems, yet believe they are alone in, the struggle, in their struggles. Too many of those problems stem from not being believed and trusted by those not living their exhausted lives. Added to that, too often they are navigating a willfully ignorant society while parenting a complex child whose very complexity brings out the most, shall we say, interesting comments from others. Must be nice having a gifted kid. Oh, by the way, I have heard all of these or someone has shared them with them. These have all been said. Must be nice having a gifted kid. It is so nice having a gifted kid. It's also exhausting, outrageously expensive, ceaseless, Overwhelming and misunderstood. Are you offering free respite care, please? All kids are gifted. They just open their presents at different times. Right. All kids are a gift, but not all kids are gifted. Not all kids take the wrapping paper and origami a scale model of the International Space Station at age four. What the hell is this twice exceptional crap? Sounds like a made up diagnosis for excuses. This crap, as you so eloquently and accurately described it, it's a child who, okay, so imagine a high powered sports car flying up Mount Everest at top speed with only three functioning wheels, the wrong octane fuel, and a parking brake that engages without warning. The seat belts lock parents firmly into the seat and only release at age 18 or 25. I'm hoping for 32. Gifted kids don't need any help. They'll be just fine on their own. Cream always rises to the top. <laughs> sure, if, if the cream is kept in the best possible conditions for rising, stick it in a deep freeze and see how well it rises then. Newsflash, it doesn't make ice cream. What has your child achieved? I thought all gifted kids were brainy overachievers, just like the ones on those TV shows. And I thought all adults could distinguish between real life and scripted TV. My bad. So glad my kids are normal. Well, back that up. Really? You think giftedness is abnormal? How interesting. Kindly elaborate. So I was thrown into this gifted and twice exceptional tsunami when our now 19 year old was four. When I was ever, whenever I was asked what he was like by doctors, counselors, therapists, teachers, administrators, all I could choke out was more, just more. The only word I could get out. He was more intense, more curious, more talkative, more nonstop, you name it. He was more from the moment he was born. Actually, from before he was born, at about 10 weeks pregnant, the doctor was trying to find a heartbeat and it would just come and go. The little snot was swimming laps. He was more from conception, I swear. As a toddler, 
he demanded scientifically accurate bedtime stories and also got his head stuck in a stairway banister. You know, <laughs> curiosity. I never would have considered gifted had a friend in a mom's group not suggested it because her kid, her, my kid sounded so much like hers. And lo, he was twice exceptional. Gifted with an alphabet soup bowl of challenges to accompany it. Gotta say though, the scenery as we careen up Mount Everest is stunning. It's just that I'm ready for the seatbelt to loosen a little bit now. Gifted. Something bestowed upon someone. Also an individual, an individual of above average fill in the blank. In our case, generally in intelligence. It doesn't often feel like a gift and in fact can feel a lot like a curse. The title of my book gets a lot of laughs because of that painful truth. But it's the word we're stuck with as loaded with emotions as it is. To the outside world, gifted is nearly synonymous with special, better than, and elitism. High achievers of whom the world demands eminence. People with hidden advantages in this game of life. But to those who live with it, gifted is anything but that. You know that? I know that. We know the pain of asynchronous development and the resulting parental whiplash. We know the deep fear around our kids' futures and trying to keep our middle of the night crying jags silent. And Lord love a duck. We know about the intensities that ping around in a gifted family. 15 years of shouting into the wind about giftedness, I'm still aggrieved and frustrated about the willful ignorance out there. The refusal to consider that giftedness is anything other than the stale stereotypes presented in society. I also intimately understand why parents with gifted teens tend to fall off the advocacy radar when their kids are older. They're exhausted and want their lives back, not to mention that the teens deserve privacy around their lives and their own stories. The gifted stereotypes out there are so broad, they border on outrageous. The little genius professor, the socially awkward scientist, you get the idea. But you know, if you've met one gifted kid, you've met one gifted kid. The nuances in gifted and twice exceptional kids don't transfer easily to traditional entertainment. The 2017 Chris Evans movie, Gifted, was the closest that I've ever seen to bringing that nuance forward. I swear some of the lines he spoke as the parent figure to young Mary have come out of my mouth, and I had to hide my tears more than once. Watching it in the theater, it took all of my willpower to not jump up at certain points and just start screaming, this is what it's like, this is it, this is what it's like to have gifted kids. And it wasn't always the sweet, heartwarming scenes showed up on the screen. The novels by Stephanie Tolan also showcase that nuance. And I loved reading them. Surviving the Apple Weiss is a wonderful book, and I hope you've read it. But for every nuanced movie, there are dozens of others where giftedness is portrayed as a genius who just needs to be taken down a peg. Is it no wonder that society wants to cut the tall poppy down? I'm tired of shouting into the wind, trying to get them willfully ignorant to understand. Heck, to just grab their attention for a moment. I simply want to know why does giftedness bother you so? How did my sons, my gifted family threaten you? I'm serious, I really do want to know. I can't see it and I am trying. I can't see how their quirky wiring, their intense personalities or, or their interests in programming languages, computer servers and the future of humankind. How is that a danger to you? I mean, unless you're a rogue AI, you're probably safe from their constant chatter on those topics. I, however, am not. <laughs> constant chatter is the soundtrack to my life. I'll leave it to you to determine whether I'm a rogue AI or an experienced mom who's gotten really good at the nod and smile. I mean, it's not as though gifted kids are sucking away precious resources, right? 
there is no federal mandate for gifted education. It's, it's left up to the states and school districts to manage and fund. It's unevenly funded, oftentimes leaving behind children in poverty, English language learners, minority groups, and those with disabilities. And in fact, I remember, I think it was at Sang last year where I went to, um, oh, one of the keynote speakers was talking about uh, English language learners and giftedness and asked the question, are they only gifted in Spanish? Are they not gifted in English? Are they gifted only in, are they only gifted in, oh, I'm ruining this. She said something to the effect of, are, are, are they still gifted if it's not their language? And she's right. So, and then um, I know of a counselor who is uh, physically handicapped, brilliant. Does that mean she's not gifted if she needs assistance with a wheelchair? So does it seem right that the needs of children are treated like this? These are children, children who are simply wired differently and require academic accommodations different from the norm. Kids on the far right arm of the bell curve really do need academic interventions every bit as much as those on the left. I mean, have you ever been stuck in a meeting where you already knew the material but were required to be there? If you're a teacher and you have sat through professional development, you know this deeply and intimately. As adults, we tend to have developed coping strategies. I'm a huge doodler. I doodle nonstop in order to pay attention and concentrate. But that's what it's like for far too many gifted kids ready to tear up Mount Everest in that sports car, but stuck behind a meandering tractor and not allowed to go around. I do sometimes wonder if those who state that giftedness doesn't matter or all kids are gifted are aligned by the thought that humans are all wired differently. And thus there are children who are quicker and deeper learners. That there are young kids out there who could potentially read and reason like an adult. I wonder if they are afraid of giftedness. Humans do tend to fear what they don't understand, so I guess that's possible. But if you don't have a gifted child at home, why be so dismissive of the experiences of those who do? Why not believe the parents and children struggling with wiring that is significantly different from the status quo? It's painful to know that there are people out there who, through their words and actions, feel the need to cut the tall poppy down. If you're not familiar with the phrase cut the tall poppy down, it's, it's um, from Australia and New Zealand. Regarding, it, it, it's, a, it's a metaphor for that one tall poppy in a field of poppies that has the audacity to come up and be taller than the rest. And so cut it down so that it's even and equal with all the others. So poppies have become symbolic for a lot of people in the gifted community in that we don't want to cut our tall poppies down. We want them to flourish. Perhaps people are afraid of needing to teach their children that everyone is wired differently. Yes, we are so very much the same. But we as humanity also do have inherent differences that are not attributable to hard work, mindset, and grit. None of us here are wired the same. Let me give you an example. I am a deep introvert. <laughs> if you've met me in person, you might find that hard to believe. I love being out and around people. I love public speaking. I love performing with my flute. But I need to recharge by being alone, something I haven't gotten a lot of the last few months. There are four of us here pinging around on it, around each other. I'm rarely alone. One of my best friends is an extreme extrovert. He recharges by being around lots of people, something he hasn't gotten a lot of in the last few months. We're both about at the end of our rope. <laughs> he and I are very, very much alike, but we have very different needs. And that's just one small example. If we can teach our kids that people are very much the same, surely we can also teach them that people have very different needs as well. Parents have a hard enough time. If you're a parent listening to this, you know this. You know this deeply. They're doing the heavy lifting, parenting, and advocating for these amazing 
complex kids. Cutting down the tall poppies just makes parenting them that much harder. Chattering on and on about our kids are gifted or giftedness doesn't matter or giftedness is just pushy parents thinking they have a special snowflake. Just perpetuates the myth that these quirky kids will be just fine on their own. They won't. I've known too many gifted people who were thought to be just fine, struggle mightily throughout their lives, and some didn't live through the struggle. Even the ones who appear to be just fine have inner struggles that they let few others see. Gifted marriages are, we'll make that a topic for another day. Two gifted people married together, again, a topic for another day. Gifted doesn't mean you have it easy. Gifted means you just have it different. And that difference needs to be acknowledged and supported, not ignored or patronized or mocked. These last few months have made parenting gifted and twice exceptional kids even more challenging. Everyone's at home, intensity is banging into one another, corona learning. Let's be honest, you can call it e-learning, you can call it remote learning, you can call it whatever you like. It was corona learning. We were all thrown into the deep end of the pool at the same time. And who, boy howdy, was it an interesting way to learn how to dog paddle. Our gifted and twice exceptional kids may have done much better learning at home. And as schools reopen, they will again struggle with more uncertainty, changing schedules, and different expectations. I'm sure you can imagine how well that might go. Let's just imagine, if we shall, my young teenage son, way back when his sensory issues were strong, being forced to wear a mask. The kid that I made a deal with when he was in preschool that you can wear, you can go without socks all year long, except when there's snow on the ground. At the time, we lived in Colorado. So, you know, when there was snow on the ground, you know, it melts in like two days. He agreed. So he would go without socks. 99% of the year. Getting a mask on that kid and keeping it on him, I'm really glad he's an adult now. So as parents, we'll again be faced with familiar pushback when we advocate for our kids' needs when they return to school. Only now that pushback will be fueled by fear and uncertainty, coupled with, oh my God, all the kids are behind. Behind what? I always want to ask, what are they behind? It's probable that gifted kids flew ahead in this time of corona learning. While their age peers struggled, it's my hope that the education system overall will adopt a more flexible model with hybrid learning, allowing ki gifted kids to advance at their own pace. But be ready for a new kind of advocacy this fall. I also wanna tell teachers, be ready for a new kind of advocacy this fall. We're all making it up as we go. Finally, we can't do this alone. Parents, we need others who get it, but it is so hard to find others in this le leaky lifeboat because it's too easy to be misunderstood and or seen as bragging. We got to use the code words. Okay, ready for the code words? Quirky, fast learner, marches to the beat of his own drummer. The drummer is playing weird rhythms. Unusual interests, complex very bright, deep thinker, but doesn't test well, easily overwhelmed by sensory input, makes unusual and profound connections, not like most kids. Then if the other parent is also using code words, we choke back tears at having found a kindred spirit and go for wine. I've done this a lot. We have to advocate for our kids in the best way that we can, in the way that we are most comfortable. Some people are comfortable speaking to policymakers and testifying in front of legislatures. Some fight the good fight by running for school boards. Some volunteer with nonprofits, some write. Willful ignorance and broad stereotypes are not going away. If anything, they're getting worse. And unfortunately, it's up to us to add one more thing to our, to our already heavy load and try and make a difference. With that in mind, parents, Please remember that our amazing kids are exhausting and take a lot out of us. No one is going to make sure we're taking care of ourselves. 
So please be a touch selfish and make sure your needs are being met too. I highly recommend locking yourself in the bathroom with the exhaust fan on. You're less likely to hear a science experiment go awry and your screams of frustrations are easily muffled with help. Some resources that you can use as you are fighting the good fight. Uh, my website, Laughing at Chaos, Laughing at Chaos at Gmail, Twitter, Laughing at Chaos. Basically, anywhere you find Laughing at Chaos on the great big wide interwebs is probably coming to me. Um, my book, If This is a Gift, Can I Send It Back? Easily found on Amazon. Um, I am an admin or co-admin of a Facebook group with uh, Chris Wells, who um, is Director of Qualitative Research at the Gifted Development Center, and Kate Arms, who is an amazing uh, uh, life coach and parent uh, advocate in Toronto. Three of us run this Facebook group, Parents of Gifted and Two E-Kids. We, we work very hard to keep it focused on the needs of parents because again, they're doing the heavy lifting and tend to be forgotten. Uh, Kate and I are presenting on, at the uh, SANG virtual conference this year. We had all intents to travel, all, we had intended to plan, I'm gonna start that sentence all over again. We had intended to travel to Minneapolis to present at uh, SANG this summer in August, but it has, been gone, it has been made virtual this year. She and I are presenting on how to talk so teachers will listen and listen so parents will talk. Kate specializes in um, teaching how to have difficult conversations. I am a parent and a teacher, and I have had many a difficult conversation. So we are really looking forward to having this uh, presentation in August. Um, the Honest Meditation app, I have been sharing this pretty much everywhere because it is, um, for starters, it's not safe for work. It's not safe for young ears. It is, um, sorry to say, profanity late. It is one of the best meditation apps I've found because sometimes you just need to let go with a very heartfelt S-bomb and it is entertaining and it's actually legitimately pretty good. So you can find his website there. Um, the 2017 movie Gifted, highly recommend it. If you want to show it to your kids, it's been a few years since I've seen it. I think it's okay for kids, but maybe watch it first so you're ready for some questions and also so you can get your own tears out first. And um, the book's by Stephanie Tolan. Uh, Stephanie Tolan is one of the original members of the Columbus group um, that came out with the um, definition of gifted that it's mainly experiences and et cetera, et cetera. At one point I had it memorized and I don't anymore. Um, but she has written quite a few fantastic young adult or middle grade novels. Um, a lot of them are centered around gifted kids and families. Um, and then I forgot to add that's coming up um, a documentary that I believe is going to be released in 2021 called The G Word, put out by Mark Smolowitz, um, about who is permitted to be gifted in the 21st century and why. And it's really focusing on underserved populations, twice exceptional, um, a very broad, it's a broad segment of gifted, but also very detailed. Um, and I think you can find more information at thegword.com. I've talked to him at several SANG conferences the last few years. I've seen snippets, I've seen previews. I cannot wait for this to come out. I, I have such high hopes for it. And I, I am encouraged that, a well-known documentarian is actually making a movie for our community. Um, so that's what I have. I will send it back to, to Miranda for any questions, comments, concerns, cocktail recipes. I can give you cocktail recipes. Um, one of the chapters in one of the essays in my next book matches cocktail recipes with the kind of meltdown you might be experiencing in your home. Um, so that's what I got. Awesome. Awesome. I, I've definitely seen the um, pair the wine with your child's temper tantrum. You know, I've had a few of those. Yes. Um, yes. <laughs> thank you for being so real with us tonight. I feel like a lot of parents really feel what you had to say. I know I, you probably saw me. I was like just nodding like, oh yeah. 
The and thank you for that. It made it feel less like I'm just talking into the void. <laughs> no, I, I absolutely understand. No, I, I, I truly like as a parent, but also as a gifted teacher, we had a Tammy was on um, earlier and she mentioned how, uh, of course, I'm not going to be able to scroll up to it because it limits how far I can go. But she mentioned how when other educators would say, oh, your job must be so easy. You have all the gifted kids. And I remember when I taught, um, I'm a gifted coordinator now, but I taught eighth grade and I had the gifted, the high, the high ability and gifted. So it was, uh, it's like 25 right. um, and about half of them were identified as gifted and they were in my group and they were in my class for um, two hours a day, back to back oh. at the end of the day, the last two blocks. Oh God almighty. And I just remember being like, because it wasn't because, you know, of behaviors, but it was because of that intensity of, intensity. of, of just, well, you know, um, the whole room buzzes. If you're in a room full of gifted oh, people, yeah. there's, um, you know, like people talk about auras and they talk about stuff, but gifted kids emit an energy. And when you put them all yes, in a group, do. and if they are especially engaged in a topic, it mm -hmm. vibrates, the whole room vibrates. And it's just such a, um, it's, it's a very cool experience at the same time. And it's overwhelming. It's draining. Um, and then to come home to your own gifted child, <laughs> it's just, and, and, and the, the, the nonstop, just the curiosity and the need to know, which is such a wonderful thing at the same yeah. time. I've uh, had people ask if I would get my certification in gifted so that I could be a gifted teacher. Yeah. And a lot of me is just like, yeah, I could totally do that. And they're like, no. <laughs> I know because what you say about the energy is totally right. I mean, my oldest son, it's like, you can feel it. It's, you, you look at a photo of him and you can feel it. It's like spiky energy. It's just like lightning bolts. Mm -hmm. Whereas my younger son has the same sort of thing, but it's more um, rounded. And so you, you feel it different, but yeah. oh, you feel it. And so if I went from teaching at school, like you said, home to it, I, I wouldn't make it past the first week. I mean, my middle school band, I have one of three. My band is 60 kids, or it was 60 kids last year. I would take a 60 to 100 piece band and a day over 10 gifted kids. And I love teaching gifted kids because they're in band and they come in for their lessons and we have a great time, but it's, they're exhausting and they're wonderful. And kind of like salt in a dish, you don't want too much of it all at once. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And I think it's hard to, you know, um, and, and I think you touched on this too, and I think this is something we talked about in our previous thing. I'm waiting for a couple people to throw some um, questions on while we chat, because um, it sometimes it just takes some time to get those questions generated. Yeah. But I, I have a thousand questions myself. <laughs> Hit me up. I found is the G word is such a challenge um, because the other kids perceive that as some kind of special prize the child's getting. So if you do pull out groups, which we do in our district, uh, they go to their gifted classes and it's just mm -hmm. like, oh, well, they're getting something special. They're getting something different um, and they're getting something better. Um, and that's, you know, just not necessarily the case. Um, and right you know, publicly being outed as gifted is a challenge, especially for a middle and high school students. I think it's a real challenge to publicly be outed as gifted. Oh, yeah. And, but yeah, absolutely. But yeah, we still have to serve those students, you know? Mm -hmm. And, and so, you know, gosh, was it 1905 when the G word was coined, you know, and over a century we've, we've been, we've had that word and um, gosh, yeah. I could probably, because we're so used to it, I have a hard time thinking of a different word, but I'm sure there's probably a better word out there for- Well, I believe in right. England, they actually use a uh, spark. They call them a bright spark, oh. um, which is clever. I like, for a long time, I was just gonna call them goobers. <laughs> hey, my kid is such, my kid is a goober. Cause you know, it doesn't have the greatest connotation. It's not negative, it's not positive, but it's so much of what I, it's a word. Yeah. It's just a word. And yet words have such power. Mm -hmm. And, you know, I used to call my oldest son challenging for the longest time. And then I went, words have too much power. I think it was about the time I changed the name in my blog from never a dull moment to laughing at chaos. Cause mm -hmm. I didn't like having never in the title. It just seemed negative. Mm -hmm. So instead I started calling him complex 
And instead of seeing his issues as challenges, they were complexities. And it was just a change of a word, essentially the same meaning, that made all the difference in the world. And I wish we could come up with something for, for addicted because it's not a gift. It, in so many ways, it's, it's a challenge. And parents who are you know, dying to get their kids, dying to have a gifted kid, I'm like, unless you've like sat under your desk and rocked, and sobbed, scared to death about your child's future, are you really sure you've got a gifted kid? Mm -hmm. um, I know that sounds terrible, but there's so much fear. Um, I really wish there was a better word. I know, and I think there's some, yeah, yeah. There's some things like, and I'm sure this is, is it, you know, your book, you discussed that, that, but you know, there's so many things that come with giftedness, that heighten sensitivity, the waking up, at two in the morning, like, what is the meaning of life? Why am I here? The existential dread, the, um, you yeah. know, I remember when child was four and he was basically expressing the principles of reincarnation to me um, and telling me that's, that was his, that was going to be his religion um, at four years old. And I was just like, How, what, what, why are these thoughts running through my four-year-old child? Am I doing something wrong as a parent? Right. Am I, yes. and now I have my, an 11, he's now 11 years old and he wants to start a podcast and he is suggesting topics for his podcast that I'm like, maybe hold off on that till you're 18 to talk about, but you have a really strong grasp of understanding of that topic. But there's well, be, just that much. It'd be great if he had a, yeah. I mean, it would be great if he had a podcast with those topics for kids. Yeah. You know, <laughs> oh I God, know. I listen. But the thing is, you know, but that's also the problem is he's, he would prefer to talk about those topics to adults, <laughs> you know, and, and I think, I think, you know, we do struggle with uh, the, the, the idea that gifted kids are easy. And I think educators struggle with that, educators who work with gifted kids, but also I think we struggle with, um, as parents, expressing you know, why am I in tears about my child? He's got an A plus. Mm -hmm. Well, he's got an A plus in the class that he hasn't looked at a finger in, you know, mm -hmm. and he's coming home to me upset every day because he's bored. You know, those are the kind of things I hear and, and I, I understand as a, as a, as a kitchen educator, but I think other people on the, who don't have that background struggle with that. Absolutely. I mean, I remember one, one year my kid came home from school in, I think it was April because it was after state testing. He's like, I learned something today. <laughs> it was the first time he's learned something all year. It was and you're like, because <sighs> like, right, because like the beginning of the year is, hey, welcome back, let's review. And then we get into this is, you know, state testing, learning sort of thing. He's like, <laughs> I already know it. April, I learned something today. And I, I, I think that sound I heard was my heart breaking. Yeah. Um, so homeschooling him when he hit from fifth grade on was fantastic for him because, you know, he got to do his thing. So yeah, Rosa actually, how they go to college. <laughs> we actually have a question. Rosa asked, um, what helped the most when you were homeschooling your kids in middle and high school? Because we know middle and high school is a challenging time to homeschool. Mm -hmm. um, and so what, was, what were some of the, the triumphs you had and what were some of the challenges you had in, in homeschooling your, your preteen and teens? Right. Well, thanks. I only homeschooled the one, so I never had both of them at the same time. The, his brother just kept going to school and has two more years left. So some of the, 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 the good things, he could learn at his pace, whether that was a little bit slower in some areas, like he really struggles with writing, um, and faster in other areas. The kid is a savant when it comes to a computer. So he was able to work at his own pace. He was able to work in as close to pure silence as he could get. He couldn't handle, I mean, he had significant uh, auditory issues. He couldn't handle being in a classroom because just the sheer fact there were 25 other people in there breathing made it hard. So he was able to work in silence. He could um, get enough sleep, you know, so he wasn't getting up at, you know, early in the morning. Like, my, my own personal middle school where I teach, we start at 7.30 in the morning. I think that's insane. <laughs> Absolutely insane. I have to leave my house at 6.30. Um, but, you know, he could sleep until like 8 or 8.30 um, and be able to then focus and concentrate because he had enough rest. And uh, being able to really dive deep into his interests. 
So again, he's a computer geek dude thing. We have a completely functioning server farm in our basement. He runs, I think it's like three servers down there. I literally have no idea what's in our basement. But he knows, he runs it, he loves it, he's very talented at it, and he is national. when he went out last year for Skills USA, he came in second in the nation in um, computer network administration. So he really, you know, was able to dive deep into what he knows and loves. And I thank God for that because that's what he's planning on studying. Some of the challenges were, I have to remind myself often that we all have gaps in our education, all of us doesn't matter where it is. And I had to make my peace with, he's going to have gaps in his education. I need to make sure that he is ready to live on his own, functional human society, in society, a critical thinker, being able to determine what is quality information and what uh, maybe not so much. And he's, he's a lifelong learner. He's not just going to go sit in a cave and cave computer or something. He's going to keep learning. So that was more for me than challenges for him. We were very fortunate. Um, when we lived in Colorado, we had several options for him for education. There was public, charter, private, several options before we got to homeschool as our only option. We moved to Illinois. It was public school or homeschool. Um, because private schools are crazy expensive and are the very fancy mm -hmm. private school. Um, we were very fortunate here that there is a gifted homeschooling co-op yes. um, not far from us. It's, it's 45 minutes to an hour. Um, and so he did that through middle school. And then as he got through middle school, um, the older kids peeled off and the parents created the teen what is it called? The Teen Learning Lab of Greater Chicago. And it is a teen, teenage learning co-op that is um, co-curricular, taught at a college level. Um, and they have a theme every year. And like the first year, everything was around Frankenstein. And the second year, everything was about around bioethics. And, and he had a lot of experiences with that. So we were very fortunate to have that. So when people are like, doesn't he ever get out and see other kids? Oh, yeah. yeah. Yeah, yeah, he's an Eagle Scout, so he made it through Boy Scouts, and he went to co-op, and, you know, now he runs D&D &D online. I mean, he's got plenty of friends. There's a lot um, of options for homeschool oh, to get out and, and, and network with other homeschool mm -hmm. parents when the kids to engage in mm -hmm. opportunities to learn museums. How oh, absolutely. You just have to and more so, more so now than when we started homeschooling in 2012. Um, and even now, you know, with everybody stuck at home, there are resources for kids online. Yeah, and that leads me into Danny's question. Danny, asks, what suggestions do you have to balance home life with remote learning? Balance home life with remote learning. I'm going to assume you're talking like school, school remote learning. <clears throat> yeah, and I think um, maybe your 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 younger son, you know, when he was trying. Okay. Yeah. yeah so, yeah. um, every school does remote learning differently. Mm -hmm. Um mainly because, as I said, we were all thrown into it and teachers were making it up as they go. Everyone was making it up as they went. Um, so he slept in and as long as he was logged into Canvas before 11, between nine and 11, um, he was considered present for the day. He, he actually brought his grades up in, in remote learning um, for a variety of reasons. But he went to all the online Zoom meetings and all the classes and actually did better. Balancing it, I'm fortunate in that he's a teen, he's a high schooler, so he's more in control of his learning. If he were younger, that'd be tougher. I would say, again, it comes down to how the schools are running it. I would, okay, I'm going to say my kid's fifth grade corona learning. I'm going to make sure my kid's getting sleep yeah. because we are under an unholy amount of stress right now. Um, and these kids are so intense, they can feel it. They may not even know why their parents are so stressed or hear it or anything, but they know something is just off kilter. So I want my kid to get a lot of sleep. And then with that in mind, um, they don't have to do, you know, six hours of school. Yes. You know, if 
they get their work done in 20 minutes? Super, they're going to go in 20 minutes, go read a book. I did that. Um, I, my son, I put a week's worth of work on the board. And I yeah. said, I said, when he just couldn't take it anymore, I said, just, just be done. Just go. Yeah. Be done. Go relax, go read a book, go play a video game, whatever, go outside. Um, and he got everything done. A lot of times he got his week's worth of work done by Wednesday and he never works past noon. And it was just yeah. about saying you, and for my sanity too, because I was working from home right across from right. him and trying to have my own Zoom meetings, my own stuff. And so it was definitely like about saying, we're going to set boundaries on how hard and how long we work in a day. And we make sure. Oh, absolutely. That, you know. Yeah. I mean, you do not have to recreate school at home. And that's the case with homeschoolers. You do mm -hmm. not have to recreate school at home. Unless you are dying to play school teacher and have a little desk and blackboard, please don't. Um, kids learn through play and they learn through experience and they learn with hands-on. In fact, adults do too, better. I'm re I'm brushing up on my Spanish through Duolingo and it's all game. <laughs> it's fun. So you do it. Um, so when it comes to the balance, just <sighs> learning takes all forms. Do what you need to do for the school. And then, you know, yeah. do learning in other ways. There's a lot of good documentaries on Netflix, even for kids. I agree. Ted yeah. Ed Go for ahead. kids is wonderful. Ted Ed videos oh, for yeah. kids are wonderful. Mm -hmm. And podcasts and all kinds of great stuff. Crash Course. Crash Course was oh, a huge mainstay of homeschool for us for a while. Mm -hmm. Yeah, there's so many great resources out there. And I think, you know, and Allison asks, um, she, you know, I think overexcitabilities have become extremely um, evident to parents in the mm -hmm. last months. Um, and I, I know mine did. And um, I think this is something I talk to parents about a lot because I think it's the uh, less understood side of giftedness. And I, there's a lot of literature out there for that. Allison Hawkins says she has a six-year-old identified gifted, not highly gifted, but gifted. Um, and she says she thinks she needs more information about overexcitabilities. Um, ideas for her, um, Living with Intensity is a good, good one, I think. Living with Intensity is a great book. Uh, Mellow Out They Say, If Only I Could mm -hmm. is another really good one. Um, I mentioned that I co-admin this group with Chris Wells. Uh, Chris is, uh, works with Michael, uh, I can never say, say his name right, Kaczewski. Um, he's the one who um, translated Dabrowski's uh, work on overexcitabilities out of Polish into English. Um, Chris works with Michael daily on the theory of positive disintegration and, the, and overexcitabilities. And she is doing a lot of research on um, overexcitabilities and how they do and do not correlate with giftedness. Um, and you guys are so fortunate to have her. She's out there in Colorado and she's a wonderful person and she's probably listening to this and like going, shut up. <laughs> um, but I, I just think the world of her and she knows, she knows more than I will ever know about anything ever. Um, but my God, does that woman know over excitabilities inside and outside? Um, Can you say so her those, uh, Chris Wells. Chris Wells. Okay. You might know her as Christiane Wells, um, yeah. but she is with a gifted development center there in Denver. Um, and she's a fantastic resource for overexcitabilities. Um, yeah, she's working on a paper with about overexcitabilities and ADHD. And if I got that wrong, Chris, I know she will tell me. <laughs> <laughs> so she's just a nice person. Right. Oh, I think we have time for one more question. All right. Um, the question is, I just lost it, just jumped in. Um, so anxiety and concerns about the future. I don't know if your boys ever had these kind of challenges. <laughs> What's going to happen next? Oh, yeah. What's oh, yeah. Happens? What oh, happens yeah. to old? Um, Nine-year-old boys constantly worry about what will happen when the world ends. Concerns about the future. What? Are we talking like the world ending next week or the death battle of the universe in seven billion years? I guess it doesn't matter. Specific, but <laughs> um, there are a couple of really good books that uh, Dan Peters wrote, um, and I'm blank. One of them is the. If you look up Dan Peters and Worry Monster. Yes. There's a fa his book. There's it's a set. One's for the parents, one's for the kids, um, and it is 
a, a fantastic resource for, for young kids like that age and anxiety. Um, basically turning the, the, the anxiety into a monster that they can basically overcome. Um, then I probably totally messed up that whole thing. But um, being concerned about, you know, worried about the end of things or, or, or death or the end of the universe or all those things is so common um, with gifted kids and yet still terrifying. Um, when your kid comes to you with these conversations and they do that at night or at bedtime, I swear it's, it's, a, it's a gifted kid conspiracy to do that to their parents as the parents are crashing from the day. Um, but that's when, you know, the dark thoughts start to plague them. Mm -hmm. um, and even teenagers, you know, I, my kids come into my room, it's 1030 at night, I'm about to turn the light off. Uh, Mom, and I'm like, oh, God, okay, yeah. <laughs> um, so the anxiety about that, I, I'm going to, to definitely defer to the experts in that field. Mm -hmm. Other than saying, I really feel your pain because I live it <laughs> still, even though my, my oldest is a decade older than yours, you just get better at dealing with it, um, at parenting it, at helping them with it. Um, because you develop better skills, you develop better um, I don't want to say you develop a callus on your soul <laughs> because it's, you don't become callous. You just become like having a, like a pencil callus from holding a pencil there. It just gets a little firmer, a little thicker, a little more resilient. You get a little more resilient in certain areas. Um, and along with that, you also become a lot more gentle because you know that the kid isn't doing it intentionally. They're truly frightened and not, it's not personal. <laughs> it took me yeah. a long time to realize that. Well, I think a lot of times that they just need the opportunity to talk it through and verbalize that so it's not in their head anymore. Absolutely. Yeah. And a good question to ask even to the older ones is, do you just need to talk or do you need me to help you hash it out? Mm -hmm. Oftentimes, you know, I like the game, what's the worst that could happen? You know, and then what could happen? And then what? And then what? I can go from sitting at my desk to living in a box behind Aldi in about three steps. Um, because yeah, oh, and then this, and then this, living in a van down by the river, <laughs> super fast. <laughs> um, so I like trying to do that with my kids or anyone just, and get as absurd as humanly possible. Mm -hmm. Um, because if we can laugh at the absurdity, it, it's a little less frightening. It's like the bog arts and Harry Potter. If we can laugh at them. They're not as terrifying. And helping them focus on what they can control too, because I know that's a absolutely. thing. Absolutely. So, what can you can can you control? So, yeah. Mm -hmm. So, Chris Wells, Dan Peters, those are great resources to add to this little resource absolutely. here. Books absolutely. Available and check out that movie. Check out her blog. Um, we were so glad to have you, and Thank your realness you. and your levity. It was very much appreciated. And uh, oh, my pleasure. We will. We will be uploading this to YouTube so that it is shareable okay. on our website and accessible to all. So Alrighty. Jen, Sounds good. thank you so much for being thank here you. and dealing with the heavy questions. And uh, My pleasure. Okay, we will look forward to seeing you virtually again um, in about a month. At good. Day. Yes, that's right. Kate and I are hard at work on this presentation. Well, thanks everybody for joining us tonight. We appreciate your audience and we will see you next week, Tuesday, five o'clock with so Colin much. Seal. Oh, he's awesome. Yes. Oh, he's you guys great. will love him. I just yeah. ordered his book today. Oh, I'm dying well, to read it. You will have to tune in next uh, Tuesday at five o'clock. I, I will. What he has to share and talking about inequities that were exposed during um, the COVID shutdown and talking about how we can be more uh, culturally responsive in our identification practices and serving our students. So we're really excited. I am there. I need that. Terrific. Terrific. Excellent. All, All right. right. Thank so you. Uh, audience, we'll see you later. <laughs>